The Luvia Project, this is a pretty heavy game, physically as well as conceptually. From the point of view of gameplay, this is a medium to heavy weight design. It's definitely not for casual Euro gamers. It is published by TMG and it is a worker placement game. If you don't like worker placement, steer clear from this design because I don't think there is much in here that you can enjoy. On the other hand, well, it really works because it is committed to worker placement. In this game, we're gonna build a city in the sky. Although the first time I look at the cover, I thought it was in the middle of the trees, maybe a gigantic forest, just because of the color of these clouds, I guess. But the theme is not really important. The city could be in the sky, on the moon, at the center of the earth, could even be in Kentucky. In the game, we still play exactly the same. We place workers to collect stuff that then we use to build more stuff that then we use to collect more stuff to build more stuff. Blah, 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 blah. But why don't I show you the game? Each player has a personal board such as this one that will allow you to keep track of several things. For example, how many buildings you have. You have a marker that starts in that box. Every time that you build a building, you move it to the next building icon. So actually, it will take you three buildings to get to that box, five buildings to go to the box with the four, and so on and so forth. You may also have other game effects that will allow you to advance this marker, but this is the general idea. And you want to keep track of how many buildings you have, and you will see soon why. Also, this board allows you to keep track of your income in three main currencies in the game. One is resources, which you use as materials to build your buildings. One is money, you can imagine that's always important. And another resource is prestige. During the game, you will perform actions that will move these arrows on your board. But when these arrows move, they don't immediately give you the thing that is indicated on the arrow. So if I perform an action that gives me three uh, more money, uh, in income, then I move that arrow, but I don't get three coins right away. However, at the end of a turn of the turn, you have an income phase in which you get to collect all of those things. In a certain sense, think of those as I don't know your monthly wage. You're negotiating them or or uh, stacking them somewhere for the month and then you collect them at the end. Which is good because it means that of course by advancing this, you don't just get two coins, you will get two coins each turn. So that is that is neat, that is cool. A key concept in the game, why you need prestige. Uh, you need prestige to score population points and at the end of the game the player with the most population points wins the game. The main way to collect population points is as follows. It, for each 10 prestige points that you collect you get to score a number of population points equal to the number in the box in which your building marker is. I know it sounds convoluted, but it's pretty simple. If uh, the situation is what you see here, and now, for whatever reason, I just collected 10 prestige points, then I get to score the number in population points, so now I have four population points. Later, the situation is as such, and I get to 20 prestige points, then I get six population points. So both of them need to be in, in good health. Otherwise, you're gonna score very often if you have a lot of prestige, but not very much each time, or maybe you have a potential for some mighty scoring that you don't get to score very often. So very interesting balance there. Next, you have this board here, which you use to keep track of the buildings that are available. Think of this as the templates of the buildings that you can build. And they're placed and organized on this board. They need to be stacked the way you see here by the numbers indicated on the back. The number indicates the turn in which those buildings become available. All of the buildings in a stack are exactly the same, so you only need to look at the one on top. So these buildings are available in turn one, these ones become available in turn two, and then three, four, five, and six. The game lasts seven turns, so you only have two turns to build, to build these big guys here, unless you use effects that let you travel to the future and build things ahead of the turn in which they are. 
also you will get a bonus in population points if you build a building the turn in which it is revealed that is if in turn two you build this one then you score more points than if in turn two you build one of those i guess because those just came out they are fashionable and you show that you are au courant and so that just makes you cool so there's another very important idea. Next to each stack of buildings, you have the number and type of resources that you need to spend to build that kind of building. And those resources are represented by these tokens here. You have the beige one, the white one, the black one, and the no one can tell. We assume that what looks purple here corresponds to this pink here. So we call it the allegedly purple resource. Now, and then we can move on to the main board, but as you go there, actually, I want to show you another thing. What you also have is cubes that you will use to buy lots of lands and indicate control of buildings and worker disks. Also, you have a number of regular workers and then you have your specialized, super special, mega awesome worker, which is taller and allows you uh, to perform extra actions. You also have a Zeppelin, which you use during the market phase. Now we get to see the main board. I find it really beautiful and pleasant. The idea of a, sky, of a city floating in the sky, maybe pasted on, may not be very relevant, but it does give you the opportunity for a nice light palette with a lot of white and green and very peaceful colors. Around the board you have a score track where you keep track of your prestige. Remember, every time you get to a multiple of 10, you get to score population points and then you have your marker indicating population points. In this area, we have tiles that will be purchased during the market phase. So when they get depleted, then you simply use other tiles from a stack to replenish the market these may give you really powerful effects so these are very important cubes they are indicating turn order and turn order is key in various phases including if not especially during the market phase because going first allows you the opportunity to buy those powerful awesome markers then we have a main area which we will use to build our city and all around the area we have those boxes where we actually place our workers to trigger and then perform actions. Each turn first you have a market phase, then a main action phase, then an income phase where you get to collect your income, repeat like that for seven turns and at the end the player with the most population points wins the game. Now, the market phase. Each player has a zeppelin. In a turn order, players will place their zeppelin next to a row or a column, pointing directly and orthogonally to one of them. You cannot point to the same, exactly the same column or row, and suppose that after we are done placing our zeppelins, things look like this. Then again in turn order you get to purchase the tiles that are in front of your zeppelin. You can purchase any and all of them if you can afford them using coins. And the cost is one coin for the tile right in front of your zeppelin and then the further they are the more expensive. Two coins, three coins, four coins. So this one would be one coin for red but three for blue. And suppose the blue buys these two and then yellow goes when it is your turn to buy if there are spots in front of your zeppelin that are empty you get a coin for each of them you place it on your zeppelin for now as a reminder that you cannot spend it just yet during the market phase you have to buy stuff with the money that you saved from before hoping that you still have some and at the end of the market phase after you purchase whatever you want to purchase then you get the tokens uh, the coins that you placed on your zeppelin. These tiles are extremely powerful. I'm not gonna get in the, this, explaining them in detail, also because doing so before uh, explaining the game would make no sense because they break or bend the rules in some ways, giving advantages. And before you know what the rules are, what is the point? But going through the even after you explain the rules to people teaching them what uh, uh, what all these styles do, what all the icons mean, is no small feat. And there's a little bit of a, of a learning curve there. 
Now, remember this is where we build the city. Usually we use these main spaces. We also have propellers where you, which you cannot buy. Normally you have to take a spe special action to do so. And, well, let's go. Let's go and start from uh, some of the actions that are uh, the most, uh, most important, like getting money. Actually, getting money with this action is not the most efficient thing to do, but you may have to do it from time to time. Now, if you place, um, when it's your turn, you place uh, one or more of your tokens in a single empty space under one of these action boxes. If during my turn I place a worker there, then I collect a coin. If I place two, I get two. If I place three, plot twist, I collect four coins. You have to place whatever amount of tokens you want to play as a single action. You cannot then later go back and add to that stack. However, later, if there is an empty space and you want to take an action again, you take another empty spot, if there is one. Here you can even get multiple of things. For example, if in my action I place four, then I collect uh, three and one, which would be a total of five. Now, each uh, box has a light blue band that tells you what happens, what advantage you've gained, if you are the first player to place their special worker in that area. So it already is a special worker in that area, then other players can place theirs, but it won't give them the special effect. So if you're the first player to place the special worker in that area, you collect two extra coins on top of whatever else it is. And the special marker still counts as a marker for all other intents and purposes. So basically I place two markers there, so they'll give me two coins. I'm also the first player to place my tall marker there, so that gives me a total of four. I hope that was clear because that may cause some confusions in new players. So we want to build stuff, we got some money, now we need to buy the land where we are going to do it. Which we do by using this action. Oh, these symbols here simply mean that you use this uh, uh, box here only with three or four players and this one only with four players. By placing tokens here you will get the right to buy lots of land in the city. For example, if I place two tokens there, then I can buy two squares in the area where the city will be built. I can buy two squares and they will cost me a coin each. If I place three tokens there, I can buy four squares, but I still also need to have the money. If I'm the first player to use my toll marker here, then I can also get an extra square for free. And when uh, and to indicate possession of those squares, so then you will place cubes on the board. You place cubes of your color. Oopsie! They need to be uh, either adjacent to the central propeller, like so, or or orthogonally adjacent to cubes that you already own. If it's impossible for you to place cubes. In that way, when you buy lots of land, then you simply can place them anyway. So when people try to bottle you up, actually, they may give you more opportunity to build somewhere else. So that's, that's how it works for that aspect of the game. You need to buy the land to build your buildings. Then you need, well, some bricks and mortar and other stuff. And you do that by placing your workers here. When you place a worker in this box, you get a number of resources, like the allegedly purple resource, equal to the number of discs that you place there. I place two cubes there, I get two of this resource. If I place it there, then I get two of the white resource instead. If Also, as you can see, some spaces don't have a coin cost, but then as these get cluttered, players that want to buy that kind of resource, they will have to spend money when they place their discs there. So that is what that uh, one icon means. If you are the first player to place their special worker in that area, then you get an extra unit of that resource at no cost. So right here, if I do that, I would be getting four of the white resources because I'm the first player with the tall marker there. So we had the resources, now we have the land, now it's time to build those buildings. And we do so by placing our markers in that box 
there. For each desk that I place in a spot there, when it's my turn, I get to build a building. Now, I could also use this action to buy a propeller, to place one of my cubes on a propeller. The action I showed you earlier to buy lots of lands only applies to empty squares, does not apply to propellers. If I use an action to buy a propeller, then I need to spend the number of coins indicated there. I immediately score the number of prestige points, and it's very small. But for nine coins, I can buy that area and get a prestige point. Because I guess the building over propellers is so complicated that if you can pull it off, it makes you famous. And then later, if you want it, you can build on it as normal. So this action can be used to buy propellers or to build buildings. To do so, again, you place workers there. Uh, if each worker allows you to build a building. At that point, you need to discard the resources that are required to build that building according to this track here. And suppose that I had enough resources to build these two. Also, I had placed my uh, two workers there and I have the land where you put them, then I simply put them on the board. For each building that I build, I place a cube there to indicate ownership, but not only. Each cube, each building has two advantages indicated on it, so actually I will also get the advantage indicated by where I place my cube. So for example, if I build that building and I place my cube there, I will get two income in prestige on my board. You remember the board we're talking about? That's how you advance that marker. And if I place the cube there, then I get one resource and three coins. Again, not immediately, but on my income board. There is also an action that I can take later that will allow me to switch the reward on the buildings that I own. And then you simply reconcile your income board accordingly. If I did that, then I reduce my incoming resources by one, my incoming coins by three, but I increase the one in prestige by two. So this is how that thing works. Um, I think we covered most of the actions, actually. Uh, what we have still is... Uh, well, this is the box that you use actually to switch things, to switch rewards on your buildings. Tall marker, first to use it, then you get to do that on an extra building. Usually for an action you can do it on one or two buildings. You can do it only if you place your uh, your workers once in the one of, of its appropriate color. There's also a neutral one, but still you can only place a single one there. Another thing that you can do is late purchase at the market, that is by spending three coins you can buy tiles that are still available at the market, which is probably partially depleted by then because people bought stuff earlier. But you may be able to get stuff that you were unable to buy earlier because of the position of your Zeppelin. Um, of course, then the important action of changing uh, player order. If I am uh, the last player, maybe I want to go first next time. So players can place their worker markers there and at the end of the turn, the turn order is reconciled accordingly. Suppose that this is the situation, now we know that green and yellow will go first, the other cubes slide down without changing relative order and that's how we reconcile order. If I'm the first player to use my tall marker there, I score a number of points equal to <clears throat> my present position. So if I place my tall marker there and I'm the third player, I score three prestige points. If I am yellow right now, to score two prestige points. So that's a good way for somebody who is behind to both get in first position, for example, and also to score some very desirable prestige points. Right now red bought the right to be first next turn and scores four prestige points right away. This is how it works. Ah, one action. We don't hear very often, that's why I forgot about it. The gardens. With By placing your marker there, you can place a marker in a lot of land that you own, but then you don't own the garden. You don't hold the garden. It stays there, but it will allow you to score extra prestige points at the end of the game. Anybody who has a building next to a garden will get extra prestige points. That also means make sure you put it in an area where other people are not exploiting that too much. 
First player to place a toll marker in this area scores two population points right away, which remember, that means victory point. At the end of the seventh turn, you score prestige points that come from gardens. You may score extra prestige points or population points directly uh, based on tiles that you purchase. Some will give you advantages that you use right away, some only score at the end of the game. So basically you collect prestige points and population points from everywhere you can find them. Remember, prestige points in turn may give you population points and at that point the player with the most population points is the winner of the game. This game is not for casual gamers. It has a learning curve which can be discouraging even for motivated gamers. Not in my group anybody bailed after I taught them the rules, but you could definitely see that it's a process, it's not something easy because you have to teach them the main mechanics and then at the end you go and you start giving them the list of the various market tokens, which of course doesn't make any sense to describe before you show the rest of the game with so many actions, so many mechanics, so many different things. Each action works in two different ways, depending on whether you're using your uh, special worker first in that area or not. There is a lot, there is a lot to digest before people just learn the rules and then they actually grok them, then they realize what they're doing. In fact, chances are the first couple of turns, so people will then realize all the mistakes that they made because they were playing rules correctly as allowed by the system, but not intelligently, not really figuring out what to do. And so you'll be short of cash one time and resources the other time. And the one you have the cash and the resources, you don't have the lot and you have the loss and not in the right position, etc, etc, etc. Of course, part of the challenge, part of the fun is precise in being able to uh, to embrace the system and then to be able to build stuff effectively and I like that very much. In fact, on one, way, on one hand, the game feels very railroaded. I need money to buy resources and to buy lots and once I have the lots I can build the buildings. So, uh, it feels like very very straightforward but then at the same time there are just so many ways of scoring with those market tiles that that really gives it a sandboxy not nature but say a sandboxy frame there are a lot of different ways in which you can approach that uh, you can try to score the buildings that have just been revealed which is awesome, gives you extra population points but that also means that you need different resources from from turn to turn so I collect a lot for this turn here and next turn different buildings are, are available and so my resources are you know, one day or one turn late. Or I have the challenge of trying every, every turn to remake my resource pool so I can have those different pools of resources that will allow me to build different buildings every turn. Or I can plan ahead. This turn, you know what? I'll I'll cut my losses, I'll accept that I'm not building anything or not much, but I'm building up stuff for the buildings that they know are coming, and then I'll be able to score a lot there. So within a mechanism that seems so strict in a sense is no money, you cannot buy stuff, no stuff you cannot build. And yet there are different ways in which you can approach that problem. I like the opportunity cost, of course, which is I like to take this action next, not now, next round. But if I do, maybe you'll take that extra bonus. So I'm gonna take it now, but now you're taking that other thing that I wanted to do. So although uh, there is an element almost a multiplayer solo because you can't really affect uh, what other people have, there is actually interaction there in the opportunity cost, which is uh, going first in the market phase. That's huge, being able to get that bonus before other people do. That's huge. Uh, it feels maybe even more confrontational than you would expect from a game in which, after all, I have my resources, I have my engine, but everything that you do, you're taking away the opportunity to do that thing to somebody else. And so that's that's interesting. That's very interesting. That I really like that element, which makes the game much more interesting than multiplayer solo. 
It is a game again, not for the casual gamer because of the learning curve, because of the grokking curve, which is not the same exactly to me as learning the rules, uh, because of the logistics of setting up the game and putting it back in the box. Uh, well, it will take a while, put there an audiobook or have friends help you because it's a big production, it takes a huge it, it takes a really large amount of space on the table. There are just so many pieces everywhere that you need to keep separated, otherwise they get all mixed up and it's a mess and then the logistics of making the design work will be even more demanding. So it's not a universal pleaser, and I don't think it's a crowd pleaser even. It really is for motivated gamers that are willing to put in the time, it's not a sure game, the effort to learn it, the effort to um, set it up and put it away, for committed Euro gamers, like I have many in my group, in fact, everybody liked it, everybody liked it. So, in a general sense, I don't think this will work for everybody, make sure that you know your players, make sure your players don't do too much analysis paralysis, because there's a possibility of that here. But in general, for the committed Euro gamer, this is definitely a solid choice.